Well, go ahead, church. Have a seat. I uh, I want to read a passage. It's not even in my notes. It just stirred in my heart. I've known it for a long time. But Paul wrote, wrote to the Galatians church, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. The life that I live in the flesh, I but live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not I who live. I'm not out living my life. Now, I know that's a, that's a statement of faith because um, we, we all spend time and energy yielding our lives to the will of God, doing things God's way or my way. How many have ever said, God, I'll do it your way, and then went ahead and did it your own way anyway? There's a lot of ways in there. <laughs> we, we all, I mean, if we're honest, our life in God is about what Paul says here. It's not I that lives. See, the truth is, if we could get out of the way, out of our own way, and let Christ in us, the hope of glory, manifest his life in us and through us, we would, we would, we would walk out his perfect will. I wouldn't say life would be easy and wouldn't be without challenge. It'd just be very fruitful, very productive for the kingdom. That, that we'd be able to spend our days fulfilling the purpose and plan of God. That, 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 and, and, and that's really what, what Paul is saying here. Is he, said, he said, I quit living my own life for me, but I live it so that Christ in me, Christ in me could live through me. Father, help us get the heart of this message today. Help us see what you want us to see and know what you want us to know. I, I'm, I'll tell you some of my secrets. I always make notes when I preach, but I rarely write a lot of down. I just usually do point forms. I put reminders. I put scriptures, and, you know, I'm praying and seeking the Lord. I wrote a lot today. I wrote more than I ever do. If I told you how many pages I wrote down, I'd scare you, so I won't tell you. I had to go back to the store and buy more sheets for my iPad. No. That's a joke. Okay. So we find ourselves continuing in a challenging hour. We're being asked to follow laws and rules that by all appearance appear to violate our rights to freely worship, our rights to free expression of our faith. When you entered the, the, the building today, you were asked to wear a mask. Now, we've been asking you that for quite a while during our worship time, but um, so you were asked to wear a mask just like when you went into the mall or the grocery store on Friday. Not just when we were singing, worshiping, but actually for the entire time that we're in this building, we've been asked to wear a mask. For many, this uh, seems like a massive overreach of the government. Murray's shaking his head. <laughs> Rules, bylaws driven by fear and confusion. You might think, well, this is our church. We are children of God. We know who we are in Christ. We can trust God. He's our deliverer, our healer. What's the problem? You might think like that. Some of you might even question the motive of this whole pandemic. Murray's shaking his head again. I wrote this just for you, Murray. No. Is this a conspiracy of the government to control our lives? 
You might say, well, I can trust God for my own protection. I don't need the government. He died for my healing. I'm going to stand on my convictions. And I know some of you in this room do feel that way. You know, I'm not going to challenge you or support you today. Sorry. I'm not going to challenge you or support you. That's not what I want to do. But I want to talk about this. I really felt like that I needed to. On the other hand, some of you may welcome the government's plan, instructing us to keep safe, keeping the economy open by distancing, masking, and totally washing all the skin off our hands continually. I'm, I'm being a little facetious. You might say this is the best medical wisdom we have. Whether I agree with you or not isn't even the point, but I can respect that perspective if that's, I can respect that. I should respect it. Certainly many in our society that we live in, so for us that's the city of Saskatoon for the most part, and especially those who don't know God or who have never seen him as healer or protector, who are often filled with fear, worried for their safety and and the safety of their family and loved ones, I can understand their thinking. I should try to understand it. It may not be mine, but I should try to understand it. And then we're dealing with political leaders, government leaders, who don't want to be held responsible for making a wrong choice or being accused of being responsible for the spread of a pandemic. that might be causing the sickness and possibly even the, the death of others. I can understand how they, the position they may feel. Personally, I'll, I will say a couple things personally, not a lot, just a couple things. I do believe the virus is real. I don't believe it's all a conspiracy. I think there's, but I'm less concerned about myself. I think if I had the choice and nobody else cared, I, 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 I'm not sure that I'd feel putting a piece of cloth over my face was, was really where my confidence was. I, I, I too, as you all know, have a revelation of God's, God's healing grace. I believe we can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Honestly, I welcome the opportunity to pray for someone who is struggling with symptoms from COVID-19. I just haven't had an opportunity yet because I, I just haven't. Nobody's come to me saying, will you pray for me? I, uh, but if you know anybody, I'll go pray for them. I, I actually, I love praying for sick people. I think it's one of our great mandates of the scriptures, and I don't know, something rises up in me every time I have that opportunity. But I also understand that people do whatever they feel they need to do to protect themselves. That's normal. So I'm not here really today in, in, in what I'm going to talk about to, to argue, you know, the merits of your position on this. But I really want to talk to us as a church about how we should, I think we should think about all this. Because sometimes I think our thinking gets caught up in, in, in the thought of the day one way or the other. Now, I'm, I'm kind of aware, and we're not a big crowd here, and I suspect we have a, a bigger sign-on crowd today. Um, I hope we do. If we don't, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'll just plead ignorance. But um, I, um, I, I think some of the things I'm going to say might challenge some of you. But I, I really believe I've heard from, from the Lord and the Holy Spirit and, and particularly how it applies to us, City Center Church. You know, my mandate principally is here in this house. I, I don't have to answer to the whole world. I just have to speak into my responsibility and my assignment. So let's just step away for a moment. I'll pick up my mask and move it. I was going to step away from our mask. I guess you really can't, but 
I'll put mine out of the way over here. Let's step away from the conversation that I've introduced. So I brought it up about masks um, and government bylaws, rules and regulations. And let's just look at the whole thing from a bit of a Bible perspective. And I want to talk about our identity in Christ, who we are, and our purpose and mission as a church, and in particular, us here in the inner city. So I want to answer three questions as I, as I kind of take us down a, 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 you know, a bit of a study, a bit of a journey. I want to ask us, who are we? Who are we? Why are we here, and what is our assignment? Who are we? Why are we here, and what is our assignment? I'm going to answer those. So who are we? Well, We're sons and daughters of God, adopted into his family, redeemed, bought back from the clutches of sin and death by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're children of God. We have made to sit in heavenly places in him. We actually have an identity in heaven with him already. We live in eternity. You've been born into the kingdom of God. I have too. And you have eternal life on the inside of you. You belong to heaven. Really, sickness, disease, and death really aren't even the realm that we, we have to deal with it. But we, we actually ultimately live in a much higher realm than all that. that th- this is who we are. We know that if you're, if, you're, if you're a child of God and you're born again, even intuitively you know that, even if you haven't really got a revelation from the Scriptures. That's on the inside of you. We have a covenant that promises us freedom from sin, deliverance from oppression, and healing from sickness and disease. We have a covenant promise of that. We are now citizens of heaven. Strangers and aliens, the Bible calls us. Some translations say sojourners and pilgrims. This means we're traveling through this life. We're passing through life. Earth is not our home. We have a heavenly calling, and eternity has been set in our hearts. We identify with him more than we identify with our life here on earth. This is really important to know who we are. Yet, or however... We are deeply aware that we have a divine purpose. Our lives are not just for vanity. I hope you really have a sense of that. You're not just here just because. I'm not here just because. I actually believed, I didn't have time to go all the scriptures, we'd been here all day, but go back to Ephesians 1, you know. You know, uh, he predetermined us before the foundations of the world, the Bible says, that we would, be, we would be here in this time, in this place. You're no accident. You're a, you're a, there's a divine design around your life and my life. You, you began to walk into it when you came into the kingdom and, 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 and were brought into Christ through faith in his death and resurrection. Each one of us has a divine calling, a divine assignment. We are destined to impact lives, to reflect the light of Christ to a broken, lost, and hurting world. We are a people with a mission or a great commission. What's a commission as opposed to a mission? A commission is someone who has actually been authorized to go on a mission. You've been commissioned. You've been enlisted, enrolled in the army of God. We have a mission, and, and in particular for us, our mission's here in the inner city. We're called to reach the broken, hurting people that walk up and down 20th Street. They're our assignment. We're to love them and care for them and serve them and find any possible way we can to, to, to reach out and touch their lives, ultimately to bring them the faith in Christ so, so that the, the, the freedom from sin that we've experienced, the deliverance from oppression that we've experienced, that they would experience. And yes, and so that they can overcome sickness and disease and walk in divine health as we have. That is our mission. And, and for, brothers and sisters, we have to keep that before us in, in everything we do. 
I want to take you now to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at, we're going to use this as our text today. I'm going to read a, a bit of the beginning of it and then, or, or, or well, starting in chapter 3, verse 3, and then we're going to read some more later on in my message. Chapter, or verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 2 begins like this, or reads like this. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How many have tasted of the graciousness of God? How many have experienced the goodness of God? He's a gracious God. I love that. I love Paul, he, that have tasted. You know, when you taste something, you don't forget it. You might see something, but when you get that flavor around in your mouth, good, bad, or ugly, you remember it. They say taste and smell are uniquely entwined, and it invokes memories deeper than your sight or your sound. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I sum that thought up like this. We're to be a spiritual house in the middle of our city, filled with God's holy people who are called to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. We're supposed to build a spiritual house here. That's why, as much as I'm glad people can join us on the camera, if you can come, I love it when you're here, because I think it adds to the anointing. I think the anointing in here can go out through the camera, but I think when you, bring, when you come in here, you add to what is in here. And when people come in these doors, they're coming into a spiritual house. And it's supposed to be filled with God's holy people, God's anointed people. But to do this, we have to be willing to sacrifice. We have to be willing to pay a price. There's a cost to be in this mission. And then the, the, the verse goes on, therefore it is contained in the scripture. Behold, this is Old Testament prophecy. Behold, I lay a Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will no, but by no means be put to shame. You believe on him? There's going to be no shame in that. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Many have been called and have chosen to disregard and disobey. Let me sum those few verses up. Many have rejected the precious cornerstone. But we who believe on him will not be put to shame. You know why? Because if we'll stay steady, there's going to be an awakening coming. And people are going to say, now I understand who you are and what you're about. There's something stirring, brothers and sisters. God is awakening something in our mission field. And I'll tell you what, these masks, this social distancing, all this stuff with the pandemic isn't going to hinder what God's got planned. We need to stay safe. But we need to keep the spiritual house alive. We need to keep it strong. We need to understand we're people with a mission. Now, verse 9, we're really getting into the heart. He says, but you, this is our identity, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Many of you know these verses. A holy nation, his own special people. We're, we get a new identity. We belong to him. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me, Paul said, Galatians 2.20. I read at the beginning that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We all have a testimony. We have a story. We, we were called out of darkness into his light. 
We need to proclaim. We need to keep. We, we, the, the, the priority of our lives is that our lives proclaim the light of the gospel. You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Folks, we have a new citizenship. I was born in the state of Alaska, the last, well, it's actually the, the 49th state, Hawaii is the 50th, the 49th state in the Union, so I have an American citizenship by birth. I became a Canadian citizen many years ago. I tell everybody I'm the only American I know that moved south to Canada, because <laughs> I was born and raised in Alaska. If you know your geography, I moved south to Canada. <laughs> Married a Canadian, she wouldn't let me leave. She tied me up. No. So for most of my life, I've been a Canadian citizen. I consider Canada my home. But when I was born again, like you, I was actually conferred a citizenship that's much higher than the citizenship I was born with or the one that I got when I went to citizenship court here in Saskatoon in the, in the 90s. 2 Corinthians 5.18, I'm not going to take you there for time, but it tells us that he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of Christ, that old things have passed away and all things became new. You know that. But it also tells us that as a result of our newness in him, in Christ, that we became ministers of reconciliation. That means we're servants. Minister means servant. Servant to reconcile men to God. That's our assignment. That's our mission. And ambassadors of Christ. You have, a, you have an assignment to help people come to know God, and you have an assignment or a commission to be a representative of heaven to earth. Do you know that? That's, that as, as citizens of heaven, you not only have an identity in Christ, a citizenship in the family of God, but you actually have an assignment back to earth. That's why we're still here. Actually, I just looked down at my notes, and the next heading is, why are we here? Well, we're called to proclaim his praises and declare the faith, our faith in a crucified and resurrected Lord. He being the chief cornerstone, we become living stones, alive, and we're his representatives to the hurting people of our city. Called to those bound by addictions, oppressed by the devil, those who have been oppressed in the kingdom of darkness, Many who feel hopeless and lost, we're called to them. They are our assignment. They are our mission. Let me tell you what we're not called to do. We're not here to claim our rights and freedoms. We're here to touch lives. There's a great confusion in the body of Christ and what we do is we confuse our citizenship in earth and our citizenship in heaven. I'm going to talk a little bit more of that in a minute. But our primary mission isn't to claim our rights and freedoms. See, if I have a problem with this, because I think it's being forced upon me, I'm doing it from the position of my citizen on earth, not my citizenship in heaven. If you don't get this, you're going to get it confused. And it's really important because this, this message is, I'm, going to, I'm using these masks, but there's a much bigger message than the masks. The message is, who are we and what are we called to do and what is our assignment? Because it touches every area of our life. Long before some government bylaw tried to dictate how many of us can gather and where we can gather and what we can do and all kinds of things that, as I said earlier, many of you feel is a great overreach. 
As long as we can carry our mission, if it costs more, so what? So what? There's nothing in this assignment that says that, you're, that it's going to be easy or simple. As a matter of fact, there's much to the contrary written in the Scriptures about the cost of coming into the kingdom of God. You actually have to give up your life. How many have ever used the phrase, I've given my life to Jesus? How many have ever said that to anybody? I've given my life to the Lord. What do you mean? I took a life that was mine, and because he gave his life for me, paid the price, redeemed me, purchased me with his shed blood on that cross. When I realized what he'd done for me, how much love and how much he'd sacrificed for me, and I accepted it and received it and was born into his kingdom, my response was, I give my life to, back to you, Lord, to serve you with my life. See, we live, in a, we live in, a, in a society, in a world where everybody's out for what they can get for them. That's the, that's the way of the world. That's the way of the, of, of the, the, the kingdom of darkness. It's selfishness, self-centeredness, self-purpose, self-gratification is God. In the kingdom of God, we lay down our lives daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. That's what that means. You don't have to carry a, a wooden cross around on your shoulder. No, you actually realize that you lay down your life for him. Our mission, our assignment, our call is way more important than any rights or liberties or freedoms. Now, I understand, and I agree, let's take a stand for the right to do our mission. <clears throat> We're going to do our mission anyway. The history of Christianity is full of people... <clears throat> that had to choose the mission over the rules of the land. History accounts all over the world where governments and, and authorities have tried to stop people from the mission of the gospel. I'll tell you what, you can't stop that. You can't stop that. And there may come a day for you and me, where we have to take a stand. And I, I, I'll be in front of the line. But let's make sure that we're not taking the wrong stand. As my dear friend, Pastor Dave McGrew said, there's not, there's not enough to gain to die on top of that hill. If we're going to die on a hill, there better be something to gain. And the gain better be for the mission for the call and for the assignment. Okay, let me talk just real briefly about the mission. I've, I've taught on this lots. Brad talks about this. But I believe our mission is principally threefold in the, in the Gospels. And I'm not going to really teach this out today. I'm just going to remind you. We'll, we'll refer to the Scriptures and we're going to move on. So, Mark Mark's gospel, chapter 16 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It tells us that those that would believe would be saved, that we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It also tells us that we're supposed to go out and lay hands on the sick and they recover. We're supposed to cast out demons. It, it, it talks about signs and wonders. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole passage here, but you know it. We go preach. It says that those that believe will be saved and the, those that don't believe will be condemned. There is an ultimate judgment of humanity that will sep leave man separated from God into eternity. We have an assignment to declare the good news of the gospel to all men. And, and, and to aid us in our assignment, the Bible says that we'll have authority over every demonic activity. We can lay hands on people. We can cast out demons. 
and that we can lay hands on sick people and they'll recover. That's why I love it. I love laying hands on sick people that they would recover. We, we do that. If you're sick here today, we can lay hands on you and you will recover in Jesus' name. Amen? That's, that, that's, that's our mission. That's part of the great commission is that we would pr- declare the good news of the gospel. In, in Matthew's gospel, should be 26, I think. It says 25 in my notes. I think it might be a typo, but not to worry. Verse 31, it says, we are commanded. No, 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 no. I'm not where I want to be. It is. Excuse me. Matthew 28. What am I doing? I got ahead of myself. It tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. The focus of Matthew's commission is not just to go and preach and get people saved, but it's actually to make, pe- make disciples. You know, here in our church, we, we have always attempted to get to create opportunities for people to come to faith in Christ, whether it be in our services, about the outreach on the streets. We've done all kinds of things over the years. Um, it's been challenging because one of the great things that we've done every week all through the summer is, is do outreaches with barbecues, and we weren't able to do barbecues, but it doesn't mean we couldn't go out in the street. I love when Brad said, well, we're just going to go back and talk to people because we can always go talk to people. We, we opened back up. Brad and I met a couple weeks ago with the health inspector about how we could bring people back in here, feed them hot dogs, and preach at them. You know what? We got favor. He said, if you'll do this, this, and this, we'll let you come and do that. You know, the rules are the churches aren't supposed to serve any food, but he told us we could. We got favor. You know why we got favor? Because we work with them. When we can, we do that. We don't want to lose the favor we have. You come down here on a Thursday night, you can serve hot dogs and share Jesus with people. Go out in the street and bring them in, bring them in here, because we're going to keep preaching the good news. And if they're sick, you can pray for them. If they're oppressed, you can cast out demons. Brad's got some great testimony. I should get you up right now, but I won't, Brad, for time. He was just sharing with me somebody who, who was obviously oppressed of the devil that he came up to him and said, I need you to pray for me. And uh, God set him free. So we preach, and then we disciple people. What does disciple mean? That people can grow in their walk with God. A lot of what we do in this building is about you learning the things and the ways of God. You know, our, our main focus in this season of our church of discipling people is our S groups. If you want to be a disciple, and this is your church, you ought to be in an S group. Because we take the time, we have, we have you know, trusted uh, men and women of God who, who can walk with you and pray with you and help you understand the scriptures even more than, than you can when we're, we're preaching a message from the pulpit. We do those mostly on Tuesday nights, but we have a group that you'll fit in because we're going to continue to disciple people that they may grow up and get, and get to know the Savior, get to know Jesus, get to know the God more and get to know the ways of God more. And then also the commission includes, this is the Matthew 25. um, And again, I'm not going to really go far with this, but Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 25. And the king had had returned and, and was talking to the people as he had returned. It's a picture of Jesus returning to the earth in the parable. And um, he began to ask them if they ever fed him when he was hungry, if they ever gave him drink when he was thirsty. Did they, did they ever clothe him, clothe him when he was naked? Did they visit him when he was sick or imprisoned? And they said to him, well, when did we see you with those needs in your life? And he said to them, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And when you didn't do it to the least, when you didn't go out and feed the hungry, when you didn't go out and pray for the sick, when you didn't go out 
and visit the hurting and broken. When you ignored the needs of the neediest in your community, then you ignored me. I've talked to you about this. I believe that's a part of the commission. It's part of our assignment. We have a responsibility to keep reaching out into our community here. And we can do it out of our own sense of urgency. You can do it with your neighbors. But we're always looking for ways to do it. We can't feed the community this Christmas, so we're going to go and take something to them. That was announced. We're going to give you more details. But minimally, and it's, it becomes dollars and cents, we're going to at least spend what we do on this meal and, and take something to all the homes in this area. I, I, we're minimally going to do 100. I'd love to see us do several hundred. Because we're going to keep reaching out. We're going to keep going out. Amen? Amen. This is, our, this is our mission. Why do we do that? Because we represent the love of God. We want the light of the gospel to shine through us. When we touch lives, it opens their heart to the things of the kingdom. And ultimately, that they might come to faith in Christ. So when we make decisions or judgments about what's going on in the world around us, in the political realm, in the, okay, I'm going to invent a new word, the pandemical realm. <laughs> I just made that up. That affects the, what I started talking about, wearing masks. We need to think about it in light of who are we, why are we here, and what's our assignment? Let's, let's think about it from that perspective and not think about it from the perspective of our rights. Now, let me just talk a little bit more about rights because I, I felt like I, I wanted to clarify this a little bit. You know what? As Canadians, we all have rights. We have responsibilities and rights, privileges, benefits, as citizens of this country. Back in 1981, the Canada, to use the official term, repatriated our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If you studied history, you know that. If you were in my generation, you remember it well. We have some rights as Canadians. The government doesn't get to control our lives. We have re religious freedom of expression. It's one of the rights we have. I'm thankful for that. We ought, as a citizen of Earth, we ought to, of Canada, we ought to, we ought to push for that. We ought to, we ought to elect those that would respect that. We vote and choose our leaders through the democratic process of our nation and as citizens of Canada. As citizens of Earth, we can exercise that right. There's nothing wrong. It's probably, it's, it's, a, it's the right thing to do. Our neighbors to the south, they have a constitution. You hear about it on the news all the time. They refer to it a lot. It has all these amendments written to it. The Declaration of Independence that was declared before the United States went to war with Britain to gain their independence. It begins with, we have certain inalienable rights and freedoms, the right to freedom and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Have you heard that? I'm sure you have. I'm just using it because we all hear more about the U.S., it seems like, than Canada sometimes. But you know what? Let me just challenge you a little bit. We have a right as a believer to freedom in Christ, but that's not the same right to the liberties that the government wants to give us. And there's no place in the Bible that says you have the right for the pursuit of happiness. There's no place. Tell me where it is. Joy comes from the inside. The pursuit of happiness is a very carnal thing. As a matter of fact, 
What the Bible says is you give up all those rights, and what you have the right to is the citizen of heaven, to endurance, to long-suffering. That's what, that, that, that's what you trade it in for. You trade in all those rights to, to the rights to serve Christ. Those who will live godly in Christ will suffer tribulations. That's what the Bible says. That's what you've actually chosen over the other. You've given up your earthly rights. Now, as a Canadian, you have those rights still. But they don't trump. They don't, they don't top what you've given up for the sake of the gospel. I don't know about you, but I'm a citizen of heaven before I'm a citizen of Canada. I know, I'm making some of you mad at me. I'm not really trying to, but I want you to get this. We are called to sacrifice our lives for the kingdom of God. We must count all as loss for the sake of our assignment. Paul says, everything that I've gained, I counted as garbage, that I might pursue Christ. Our mission is to represent heaven, and this requires us to pay a price to endure hardship and to suffer loss. Now, when, you, when, when I put it that way, being asked to wear a mask is really nothing. Because I'll tell you what, the day could come when you're going to be asked to give up a whole lot more than that. Paul declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have from God. You got, you got the Holy Spirit from God, and you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. For you were bought at a price or with a price. Which translation are you reading from? Therefore glorify God with your body. In other words, let your body use to bring glory to God. So what we do with our life and our body, we must judge according to our mission. If wearing a mask means that I can freely minister to others, I would gladly wear a mask. If wearing a mask means that I can continue to make disciples, I would gladly wear a mask. Because I, it's more important for me that we meet as us groups, even if we have to sit with a mask on, which seems absurd. But if that's what we have to do, then I would gladly do it, because the mission is more important than the freedom. If wearing a mask means I'm free to go and reach out to a hurting soul, I'm gladly wear a mask. It's a small price to pay. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I go into the grocery store or go into the mall, I don't go in the mall very often. I'm not a mall guy. But I do go in the grocery store from time to time. My wife tends to do most of the shopping in our home, but, but I, now that we don't have any kids around, it's, it's easy for me to go as her. I became very aware before, you know, the, the, this 28-day mass mandate, as you'd go into public spaces like that, that most people were already wearing masks, I'm sure because of fear and worry and cause some of the things I talked about before. And I'm one of these, I don't need to wear a mask. And one day the Spirit of God said, you know what? You're already put a wall up if you want to minister to somebody. What do you mean, Lord? Because I, I do that. Uh, you know, you're, you, you, you have opportunities to shed a little light when you're in public. I don't know about you, but look for those opportunities. I hope you do. I know Bob does. Bob is the inventor of those opportunities. You know, if, if you're people are going, you know, stay away from me because somehow I have the right not to wear a mask. 
What are you doing? Are you thinking about your mission or are you thinking about your rights? I'm just challenging a little bit about your thinking. Because we get into this mindset, somehow we have a right. I'm telling you, I've told you this several times, you're, you're actually judging based upon your citizenship of earth, not your mission from heaven. Ambassadors adapt to the culture of the country they're going into. They don't bring the culture of where they came into their country. You're an ambassador of heaven. Well, you say, well, I'm a heavenly ambassador and I stand for divine healing and faith. Well, that's good. Cover your mask and pray, put a mask over your mouth, pray for the sick, and when they get set free, they'll believe what you have to say. And then you can go down that road if you want. But if they'll never get, let you interact with them, what have you gained? The Apostle Paul actually, I want to read this because I put it in here. Wearing a mask is a small price to pay. The Apostle Paul went to Rome where chains awaited him. That's what the Bible says. It was prophesied chains were awaiting him. He had a, a prophetic word spoken over his life when he got converted to say that he would go before Gentile kings to bear the name of Jesus. Go read it in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. He actually used his citizenship in Rome to go to heaven knowing that he would be imprisoned just so that he could bear the name of Jesus before a king. He gave up his freedom to fulfill his mission because he knew that he was a citizen of heaven. He writes... In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or yeah, verse 19, talking about the liberty he has in Christ, I'm picking up kind of a mid thought here. For though I am free from all men, in other words, nobody has control over me, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Isn't that what he said? I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became a Jew, and that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. He said, I'm, I'm willing to yield to all the laws just that I might win them. Although I'm not under them anymore. He says... To those who are without the law, he's talking about the Gentiles, then I'm without the law. He goes, to the weak I've become as weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now I do this for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. You know, some translations when he says I became weak actually say, they may not be quite as literal, but that I become weak in my faith. So then you say I don't need to wear a mask because of my faith. Really? Really? That's not the point. The point is that you, you do whatever you need to do that you might win some. We, 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 we get this confused. I never want to offend anybody because of my rights. If we have to put a mask on to come here to build a spiritual house so that we don't have to go to war with the government. Now, when they tell us that we can't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, well, we're going to go to war. We're going to take a stand. They're going to take me away in chains. I'll do that. But we're not there. I think you know that. It concerns me that someone would say, well, I'm not going to go to church if I have to wear a mask. What do you, we have a mission. We have an assignment. We're trying to create a spiritual house. We're trying to play a place where people feel comfortable and free to come in. Think about this for a second. Let's just say we decided 
which obviously we're not, and, and I'm making that really clear why. But let's say we decided, you know what, we're not going to wear masks because we, we don't, you know, we, we, we have our rights and, and the government can't tell us what to do and we're not worried and we're going to be in faith. There's a lot of people that would walk their head in that door, look at us, and walk right back out. And then what do we gain? Okay. But I know I've talked to some other pastors. I know churches in our province who've lost people. Families refused to come. They've quit the church because they told them they had to wear a mask in church. They quit church. They said, well, then I'm, I'm not coming anymore. I'm going to find another church because I, I don't believe in that mask stuff. They, 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 got the, they, 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 don't, they forgot their mission. They're fighting for earthly rights. Okay. Let me take you back. We're going to land this thing. I'm coming to a close here. But there's a powerful verse I want to read. We started out in, in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 where we got into our, you know, we're a holy nation. We're a special people. We got into understanding our identity in Christ and who we are. So I want to pick it up. I'm going to read that part. But I want, I want to read what follows after it because usually we stop right here. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but now obtain mercy. Okay, so that's our identity. Now it goes on. Beloved, I beg you as soldiers and pilgrims. Remember, I referred to that. But this is where it comes from. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war after the soul. Don't, don't go after things that benefit you. Don't go after your own personal desires. Lust doesn't just mean, you know, sexual immorality. Lust just means desire to fulfill the things that you want in life for you. Verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Behave a way that the world's going to say, that you're honorable. Right now, that's wearing a mask. And when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. What it's saying is the way you behave in their presence will determine whether they're going to honor God at the day of visitation. Now, you can take that one of two ways, when Jesus returns or when he visits their lives. Are they going to surrender their life to him? It says when they watch you and the way you handle yourself, it'll say a whole lot to them. Okay, let me read on. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether to the king as supreme, we don't have a king, we got a premier, or governors, as to those who are sent by him to punish evildoers for the praise of those who do good. So this could be like the premier and the health officers and the police. I see all that right there. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, so you're free, you're free to do whatever you want, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, and fear God and honor the king. Now let me read it out of the New Living because it's even a little more direct. Just this last little bit from verse 12. Be careful how you behave among your unsaved neighbors. For then, even if they are suspicious of you and talk against you, they will end up praising God for your good works when Christ returns. For the Lord's sake, obey every law of your government. Those are the king as head of state. Those are the king's officers. And for he who has sent them to punish all that do wrong, which would be the enforcers, the police. Verse 15, it is God's will that your good lives should silence those who foolishly condemn the gospel without knowing what it can do for them. There's all kinds of people out there that are foolishly condemn the gospel because they don't know what it can do for them. So our good lives 
should silence them, is what it says. But that doesn't mean you are free to do wrong. Live as those who are free to do only God's will all the time. So the only freedom we have anymore is to do what God wants us to do. We've given up the other. Show respect for everyone. Love Christians everywhere. Fear God and honor the government. I don't know, I think that kind of answers it right there in the scriptures. See, what it's really saying is the choices and decisions we make are based upon our mission and our assignment and our citizenship in heaven, not in our earthly rights. Now, this would be a good message whether it's mask or not because a lot of times we live our lives in such a way that we're just serving ourselves. And really, we're called to sacrifice for the sake of our mission and our purpose.